and it's a good day to be in the house. Amen? Amen. Hey, we're going to be in John chapter 15 this morning, and we kicked off a series last week at our birthday. Look at, hey, look at your neighbor, if you didn't have a chance to say it last week, and say happy belated birthday. Shout out to belated birthdays. Uh, Favorite City turned two years old last week. Let's keep giving it up for the Lord for that, for milestones, and we love to celebrate that because we get to celebrate everything God has done and look forward to what He is going to continue to do, amen? Uh, and we expect Him to do a lot, and I'm so glad that you're here Sunday after the birthday as we just continue in our series, Expect. Somebody say, Expect. Expect unspoken and unmet expectations often lead to the greatest moments of relational disunity. Amen. I mean, we see this in our marriages and our relationships with our children, with our friends. We, it, there's an expectation that goes unmet in your life. It leads to this sense of discord relationally. Right? We, we expect things from people that we love, don't we? We expect our husband to take out the trash, right? We, we expect our kids to clean their room. We expect our boyfriend to send the text to let us know where he is. We expect things from people that they often don't deliver on. Can I get an amen? Anybody been disappointed by somebody this week? Come on. Don't look at your spouse. Don't just raise your hand, okay? This was just just right here, just me and you. We've been disappointed by people. It happens all of the time when we don't get what we expect. Last week we talked about our expectation of God. We read this verse in John fourteen fourteen that just messed me up. Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, "Here's what you can expect: anything that you ask in my name." I will do it. And that verse just started to wreck my heart. And I just started to think, do I have that type of expectation? Do I have that type of faith-filled expectation that when I'm on mission with Jesus, anything I ask in his name, he will do it? And for me, the answer was no. And I felt like for us as a church, the answer is not yes. And we need to collectively get together and say, okay, if Jesus said this, we must believe this, but we've got to understand with confidence how we move forward in our expectations because nothing leads to greater relational disunity and discomfort than unmet expectations. We've all prayed prayers and felt like we were left on Read. And so today, as we jump into, we transition, we turn the corner from John chapter 14 into chapter 15. And as we do that, what we're going to find is there's a little bit of a shift. While it's all met and covered in the expectation that we can have that God's going to move in our life, there is a shift where we can really dive into and understand what are the expectations of a disciple of Jesus. That he has some expectations of us. He has a great expectation of us. And if we don't understand that, we'll never understand and walk in John 14, 14 if we don't understand John 15. And so the question is this, what is the expectation of a disciple? What is the great expectation of a disciple. You're probably here, maybe you've come to faith, or maybe you've, like, you got baptized and you have some discomforts and some disunities and some things in your life that aren't going the right way, and there's probably one word that led you to make a decision to start coming to church and to give your life to Jesus, and that word is hope. Hope. You're, you're hoping that something will get better. You're hoping that I will get some answers. I'm hoping that I will find some friends. I'm, I'm hoping for something. Hope is really just a great expectation and if we look at what the expectations of a disciple of Jesus are I think we'll uncover how our greatest desires and expectations will ultimately 
be met. I want to give you a little bit of a recap because we've taken our time been walking through the gospel of John and John 13, 14, and 15 really kind of string together. It, it's, it's a lot of time devoted to a short, it's a lot of scripture devoted to a short amount of time. What we have in John chapter 13, there's this scene where Jesus and his disciples gather in this upper room and uh, it was common for his for in in that time when when travelers would come into a home as an act of hospitality, uh, the servant of the house would bend down with a basin and a towel, and they would get that basin and towel, and they would wash the dirt off of the travelers' feet as they would fix and prepare them dinner and have community. And Jesus certainly wouldn't have been the person that would have assumed that servant role as as a respected. Bible teacher, as a respected religious leader, as a one who people were calling a prophet and admiring and disciples are flocking to him. But he said, you know what? I'm not too big. I'm not too great because leadership is ultimately service. And he has this surreal moment with his disciples where he bends down with a basin and a towel and he wraps a towel around his waist as if to take the complete role of a servant and he washes their feet. And then you remember what happens at that dinner. They have this really awkward family moment (laughs) where he says, hey, actually, you know, I know we're all, I'm glad we're all here having dinner. (laughs) You know, when mom or grandma or somebody decides to drop the awkward family bomb (laughs) at Thanksgiving, (laughs) we pray against that this year (laughs) as we move into the holiday season, but Jesus drops this really awkward family bomb in the middle of this supper, and he says, one of you are going to betray me. One of you is actually going to sell me out, and John kind of leans over, and he's like, who's it going to be? And Jesus is like, well, it's the one who dips their hand in the dish, and sure enough, Judas dips his hand in the dish. Shortly after that, he kind of runs off to do his business. Jesus is like, what you're going to do, go ahead and do it now. And they're like, is Judas leaving? Why is he leaving? Is he the one that's going to do it? And everybody's a little bit confused, a little bit tense in this moment, starting to rise. And they're like, well, if it was Judas, well, I'm glad he's gone. And he's like, well, you know, and some of this commentary is mine, so please give me some liberty here. And Jesus looks at the moment, he's like, well, you know, Everybody who's here still isn't good. Peter, you're actually going to deny me three times. And he exchanges with Peter in this powerful moment. He's like, you're you're actually going to deny me as well. There's going to be betrayal. There's going to be denial. There's going to be unmet family expectations in this moment. And the disciples, you can just almost feel their heart rates rise and their hope going down. And Jesus then assures them in John chapter 14, where we've been for the past several weeks, that I am actually, listen, it's better that I leave because I'm going to send to you the Holy Spirit. When I go, the Holy Spirit will come inside of you and you will do even greater things than we did together. You'll do for me. And then he says, anything that you ask in my name, I will do it. And he says, as a result of the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you, Peace be with you. Don't let your heart be troubled, but let peace overwhelm your path. And he sends the disciples. And then this moment, right in John chapter 14, verse 31, he says, the second half of that verse, rise, let us go from here. And they exit the upper room and they start this journey from Jerusalem through the Kidron Valley, and they start this journey on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, if you don't know really what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane, you're like, you're saying a lot of these names, and I have no idea what that is, and that's okay. Essentially, you have Jerusalem, where the primary temple is, and then you have the Kidron Valley, that would would be the path that they traveled on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane, where the Garden of Gethsemane is ground zero, where Judas sold Jesus out, and then ultimately Jesus Jesus was captured by the soldiers. He went willingly with them, but they came and captured him from that garden. This, it's just, it is a hallmark, is an iconic place where Jesus was taken ultimately to the cross from the garden. And so he starts this journey from Jerusalem, from the holy city on a hill, through the Kidron Valley, and ultimately to end up in the garden of Gethsemane and on the journey at some point along the journey 
he delivers to them some of the most powerful imagery in all of our Bibles. He delivers to us one of the most fundamentally important messages that he could ever give us and leave with us. And like he often did, he uses the world around him to paint a picture for what our life and expectation should look like with him. Now, there's a scene at the, at the entrance of the temple. It's, there's a, a historian by the name of Josephus, and he tells us at the entrance of the temple of Jerusalem where they're leaving, the city where they're leaving, there's actually this enormous, Josephus tells us that at that time, here's what was actually on the gate of that temple. The gate opening into the building of the temple of Jerusalem was, as I said, completely overlaid with gold. This is the picture in front of the temple, as was the whole wall around. It. it had, moreover, above it these golden vines from which dependent grape clusters as tall as a man. So there's this picturesque statue engravement over the door of the temple of Jerusalem in this time that would be this picture of a vineyard of branches and vines and grape clusters that were as tall as a man. There was this picture because from The Old Testament all the way through until now, God has used the picture of a vineyard to describe the relationship that he has with his people. And so he begins to tell them this. I'm going to read John 15 all the way, 1 through 8. And then we're going to stop and dissect verse 4 and 5 today. If you're ready, say I'm ready. All right. He says this. Most likely, right now, they either have the picture or they know the picture well of that temple. Maybe they're crossing a vineyard right now in the Kidron Valley. But they know this picture, this imagery of a vineyard. And he says to them, maybe even as they cross one, as they pass one, as they see one, he says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that does not bear fruit he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branch, branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish. And it will be done for you. For this, my, by this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Let me pray for us. Jesus, I pray that you would just illuminate this text for us. This powerful moment that you have with your disciples. Have it with your disciples right now. Have it again 2,000 years later right here at Green Valley High School. Teach us what it means to abide in you. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Amen. These eight verses are loaded down. In fact, i written a beautiful sermon on Tuesday, okay? It was wonderful. It was great. It was so awesome. It was alliterated, and it, was, it had illustrations, and it had all the points, and I got through it. I was done on Tuesday, guys. I'm normally done on Thursday-ish, but I was done on Tuesday, praise the Lord. And then on Wednesday, the Lord messed me up. <laughs> And the Lord messed me up as I began to just continue to read this text and begin to continue to have conversations around this idea and look into these verses. I just began to realize you can't go too quickly from this, homie. Like you've got to sit in these, we've got to sit in these verses for a little bit because I think that God, the, 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 the great power and opportunity of hindsight is that we can sit with some of the words that Jesus had with his disciples in a moment, and we can sit with them for a season. 
And I just wonder what would happen, Favor City Church, if we sit with John 15 for a season. Because I know here's what we want to do in the name of the Expect series. I wanted to jump to verse 7. Anything you wish. He said wish in that one. <laughs> Anything you, he said wish, y'all. <laughs> like, I know how to make an Amazon wish list, you know. Like, I, I know how to do the wish thing. And, but Jesus just really just kindly and compassionately and firmly got a hold of my heart. So there's a lot more in this text that I need you, the church, Favor City, the body of Christ, to sit in for a season. So as we look at the scope of this text, I want us just to know that God has something powerful for you. If you believe that, say amen. Amen. At least 15 of you believe it, so we're going to keep going. All right. And what do we see? We see in this text, there's, there's a couple of words that are mentioned several times. One of those words is the word fruit. The word fruit is mentioned six times throughout these eight verses. And the word fruit is something that we like to talk about in the church. We say, will our life bear fruit? We think about that whenever somebody uh, is a part of the church and then maybe they fall away and they go and they're like, well, they never bore any fruit. They never, their life never bore any fruit. And it's kind of like a silly picture. For those of you who don't have much context for church, you hear somebody say that and you're like, I, this is one of the reasons why you think Christians are so weird. <laughs> okay, you're just one of many you're like they're talking about bearing fruit and covered in the blood and I don't know like I just need to go somewhere else right this is to bear fruit is a very important thing when it comes to the life of a disciple because verse 8 said this I want to read verse 8 again he said by this by the fruit bearing my father is glorified that you may bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples it's important Right? It's, it's an important aspect. In fact, it's the defining characteristic of a disciple is the fruit that you actually bear. So what is fruit? Paul tells us what fruit is in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. He says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Let's read this out loud. Can we read it out loud together? Is everybody here? Let's do it. One, two, three. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against such things there is no law. This is the, uh, yeah, give yourself a hand. Come on. That was great. You get an A plus in reading today. The fruit of the Spirit. Notice it's not the fruits of the Spirit. The fruit that is produced out of the Spirit living inside of you. Jesus said, I'm sending the Holy Spirit, the helper, the parakletos to come alongside to defend for you, to make a defense for you. When that Holy Spirit, when my Holy Spirit dwells inside of you, you will bear much fruit. Paul says, says, listen, the fruit of the Spirit, the result of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Verse 24 in Galatians 5, it says, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit-filled life is when you are loving. The fruit of the Spirit-filled life is when you are joyful, when you are peaceful, when you are patient. Come on, any dads or moms in the room need some patience? Any teenagers need some patience in the room? We need patience, kindness. It's when you're kind to one another. Sometimes we just got to remember to be nice, <laughs> right? Just, can you just be nice? But how many of you know I need something extra in me if I'm going to be nice to them? I need something extra in me if I'm going to have peace through this chaos. I need something extra in me if I'm going to have self-control and not fly off the handle. I need something extra in me if I'm going to be faithful, if I'm going to be gentle, if I'm going to be loving. And fruit is the char defining characteristic of a disciple. You would think that this would be the next command. Go bear fruit. Right? Go bear fruit. 
go, like, like, watching, uh, like watching Groot from Guardians of the Galaxy regrow in that pot. You know, like, go, just work as hard as you can and grow fruit and grow leaves and actually be fruitful and do good things and start ministries and feed people and love and be patient. You would think that the next command would be go and bear fruit. But that command actually isn't in this text. Where there is an expectation that we would bear fruit, the command go and bear fruit is actually not in there. Here's the command, verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. What's the command? Come on, tell me. Abide. Abide. It's not bear fruit. It's stay. It, it's, not, it's not go and do good things. It's stay right here with me. I was walking with the kids to downtown Summerlin yesterday. We were kind of a family day. We went to the little pumpkin patch, you know. Shout out to dust in your uh, eyes and <laughs> lungs and <laughs> everything else. While your kids ride things that you hope don't kill them. <laughs> like, is there supposed to be a bolt there? <laughs> uh, <laughs> saw Mark and Q walking your baby around. Look at all cute young couple. Come on. Uh, man, and there were multiple moments we're walking like up to traffic. And Cannon has just reached the next level of confidence. <clears throat> and he would start running and I would say, hey, Stay. Right here. <laughs> the, the command that I gave him in these moments of tension was not, hey, go find the car. Would you go find the car, would you? <laughs> Here's the keys. You're seven. Go, would you go get the van and pull it around? The command to Cannon, my defenseless, unaware child who is wrapped up in a whole other dimension that he's not even a part of right now. He's just got, he's got an imagination that's amazing. But man, when we're in a parking lot, can you just stay here? <laughs> Abide with me. Hold my hand. I know you don't want to right now, but you're going to stay with me. Why? Because there is safety in abiding with your Father. Jesus says to them, listen, abide in me. I'm going to get you where you need to go. I'm going to keep you safe along the way. I'm saying pray peace. Yes, absolutely be confident as you move. But listen, here's the command. Don't go do great things. Stay with me. Abide in me. Abiding is this. Very simply, write this definition down. Abiding is staying connected to the source you trust. Abiding is very simply staying connected to the source that you trust. When you look at this word abide, the Greek word meno, it means to stay, to remain connected. Remain connected. And when this word is used throughout scripture, it's translated most often abide. Sometimes it's actually translated to wait. And to have this actual expectation of faith, to wait and remain, to wait and watch, to abide is to stay with anticipation because you trust the source that you're connected to. To abide is to remain where you know you will be fed. To abide is to stay connected to what has fed you in the past, what's been faithful to you in the past, so you know it will take you into the future. To remain connected is to stay connected and abiding with the source that you trust. The one command here is abide. He says, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. Then Jesus breaks down this imagery a little bit further in verse 5. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do. What does it say? Apart from me, you can do. We don't like that word, so nobody's saying it. Apart from me, you can do. Nothing. I'm the vine. Here's what Jesus is saying. You know, when you get the picture of a vineyard, I want us to take ourselves into that picture. If you've been to Southern California, you're 
You've seen these great vineyards, which put that picture in your mind. Just think agriculturally, not spiritually for a second, okay? Just think about the great vineyards, and you think about the vines that are growing, that, that the vine dresser puts in a specific place to lift the branches off of, off of the ground and, again, and off the rocks so that they could bear fruit. But think about the source of the vine is the most important part of the vineyard. The source, the vine is the most important part. It's the life-giving part. It's where the nutrients is. It's where everything that matters exists. He says, I am the vine. What did John, what did he say in John 14? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the what? I'm the way, the truth, and the Come on, everybody, come to life this morning. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. He's saying, all life exists in me. Everything worth living and worth doing is Jesus. I am the vine. You're the branches. I got good news and bad news. What do you want first? I'm going to go with the bad news first. (laughs) You're a branch. You're, you're a branch. I grew up in Alabama, and, you know, one of the skills they teach you as a child is how to climb trees, right? If you ever climbed a tree and you're climbing up the tree, what do you do? You look at the branch, and you examine, is that a dead branch, or is that a branch that's alive? And it's very important that you make the right choice, because when you make the wrong choice, you end up on your branch, you know what I'm saying? Like... And you fall, and you hurt yourself, but when you make the right choice, and you actually attach your foot to a branch that's connected to the tree, that's alive, that's connected to the nutrients, what happens is that branch can hold you up. Why? Because that branch has life inside of it. The bad news is you're a branch. (laughs) And when you get broken off of the tree, here's what you are. You're firewood. When we go look for firewood in the woods in Pike Road, Alabama, we find the the branches, we find the things that have been disconnected from the source source for a significant amount of time. Why? Because they're dry, they're without nutrients. We pile them up, and what are they good for? A little lighter fluid. They light on fire. Right? It's firewood. Well, when you're connected to the source, when you're connected to... A life-giving vine. Here's the good news. You have life inside of you. You're a strong branch. You are made in the image of God. And when you are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and you're abiding in the Father, you are abiding in the Son. When His Word is abiding in you, you're not just a branch. You are a life-giving, power-filled conduit for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are full of power and life, and you will bear fruit. (laughs) Bad news is you're a branch. You're a stick. You're like a switch that your mom makes you go pick. The good news is that when you're attached to the vine, there is no power that is off limits. There is no fruit that is off limits for your life. There is nothing that you can't, because you'll do exactly what the branch was designed to do. Have you ever walked up to an orange tree or a lemon tree or an apple tree and see a, see a piece of fruit just growing straight off the trunk? No, no, that would be ridiculous looking. Like you'd look at it and you'd be like, there's some, that, that's a GMO right there. That is a genetically <laughs> modified, like that is something going on funky with that tree. <laughs> Why? Because the tree was not designed to bear fruit straight out of the root, right? It wasn't, you're like, that tree's got a pimple or something. Like what in the world is going, but the tree was designed to have branches. Listen to me, you are not God's plan B. You, we are not God's plan C or D or leftover. It's like, hey, because I can't get there, I need you guys to take care of this. No, no, no. God's plan A has always been to use his people to share his love. God's plan has always been to use his, his people to share his patience, his peace, his gentleness. You see, his, self, his self-control, he wants to show the world through your fruit not straight off of the vine no 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 he wants to see it coming out of the branches 
riches. He wants to see your life be full of peace and patience and joy, praise God. He wants to see you thrive because you are a branch. And that's good news because you get to bear fruit. Listen, write this down. God's greatest expect, or don't, but I think it'll be better if you do. <clears throat> God's greatest expectation of you is to stay connected to him. His greatest expectation of you is to stay connected to him. He wants you to stay close. He wants you. Everything that's stressing you out right now, everything that's got you in a tailspin, everything that made it hard for you to get here, his expectation of you is not to fix that problem for yourself. His expectation of you is to stay so deeply connected to him and his word, is to, is to just move so, so free-flowing in the spirit with him that when you pick up the word of God, you don't feel it. You don't feel it yet. You have to will yourself to get there. You have to will yourself to stay connected because you know, here's the deal. If I don't stay connected to him, I will die. I will wither. I will fall off. And I won't have any hope. His greatest expectation of you is not to produce fruit for him. It's to stay connected to him. His expectation of your life is not that you would make your life wonderful and fruitful. His expectation of your life is that you stay connected to his life. His expectation of you is to stay connected to him. As the band comes up, I want us to have these two questions, or this one question, really. Whether you're a believer or not, this is the one question for us today. Where are you, a.k.a. The branch <laughs> connected. I started to say, when I first wrote this question, I started to say, where's your branch connected? And I was like, oh, I'm already getting it backwards. I'm already thinking we're the vine. It's not about where your branch is connected. No, no, no. Where are you, a.k.a. branch? <laughs> nice to meet you. Where are you connected? You know what's interesting about that first verse he said, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. So we, we have to understand the assignments. We have to understand the movie roles right here, okay? He's looking at the picture. He says, listen, there's a vine. There's a vine dresser. And there's, a, there's fruit. And in between the vine and the fruit, there's a branch. That's you. I'm the true vine. Meaning what? There, there's some false vines. There, there's some lesser than vines. There's some vines that we think we can fruit. Where is your branch? No, no, no. Where are you, the branch, connected? Who are you connected to for your affirmations? Because I'm telling you, some of you are looking for your spouse to give you only something that only Jesus can. I need to say that again. I think some of y'all missed it. Some of you are looking for your spouse or your significant other to give you something that only Jesus can. They're not the true vine. You're like, but they divine. <laughs> like, okay. All right. Meme it, post it on social media, and then get back to reality, okay? They are not the true vine. They will not give you the life that you need. They will not give you the hope and satisfaction that you need. He's the true vine. Because how many of you know that you can't be to them what you're actually asking them to be to you? How many of you know that you let them down just as much, if not more? Praise the Lord. In my case, it's more. You let them down way more than they let you down. 
So let's stop just sucking the life out of each other and leaving ourselves as branches withered on the ground. And let's attach ourselves for the sake of being a a branch that is full of life and bearing fruit attached to the true vine. Let's don't attach to any of the, the praise or the affirmation that we get from social media or our work performance as the true vine. Let's don't attach ourselves to some type of vice that we think, you know what's going to help me bear fruit is just to numb my mind with alcohol or drugs or to accelerate my mind with just one more cup of coffee (laughs) or to overeat myself into an indulgence to just feel some sort of pleasure. Listen, this isn't about isolating one sin. This is about isolating our connection point to Jesus. And saying, what is in the way of me being able to connect to the true vine? Is it alcohol? Is it something that is getting in the way? Is it something that is just numbing your mind? Is it a relationship that's not life-giving? What's keeping you from staying connected to the true vine that will give you life and help you bear fruit? What is it? Is it lust? Is it pornography? the approval of others. There's all types of vines. And really, if you don't know Jesus, the question is the same. Where are you, the branch, connected? 1 John 4, 15 says this, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him. Are you ready to connect to God today for the very first time? Are you ready to connect your branch? No, no. Are you, the branch, ready to connect to the vine? Because if you're honest, everything you've been connected to has promised you purpose and failed to deliver. When you connect to the true vine, you'll have peace that pushes through any ounce of misunderstanding. You'll have joy that gets you through every moment of despair. You'll have self-control that gets you through every absolutely just gut-wrenching moment of anxiety. Connect your life, the branch, you in a prayer before we sing this song and hey if you want to do that for the very first time there's two ways you can respond number one there's going to be some ministry leaders at the end of each aisle as soon as I say amen everybody's going to stand up and you just need to act like you're going to the bathroom but don't go to the bathroom okay go to one of those ministry leaders and say I need Jesus I want to connect my life to his and they'll help you do that If you don't do it right here in this worship service, there's a what's next tent outside. You can go to one of those leaders at that tent. But whatever you do, don't leave this room today without connecting your life to his, without following his one and most great, greatest commands. Abide. Connect to him. Jesus, we love you. As we get ready to sing to you, I pray that you would give us the courage to trust you give those in the room that are debating whether or not they can trust you the courage to stand up and walk to one of these leaders you give them the courage to walk and connect their life disconnected from these false vines and connected to the true vine so that we may have life thing before I say amen. That this altar, the front of the stage is is here for you. Right there, you can turn your seat into an altar where you can have a moment with God right now. And maybe your confession needs to be this, God, I've been trying to connect to everything but you. Teach me how to abide. 
teach me how to be more like you. You see, the branch, really, it's one goal. The reason it grew off the vine was to be filled with the life of the vine. Jesus, make us more like you. Would you respond and sing with me?